Well, good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. And uh, I'll say once again, this is a pinch-free zone for the morning. Uh, in other news, we've got ants in our house. When they were swarming in Karen's bedside clock, that was weird, but I dealt with it. When they were swarming in the Wi-Fi access point, that was weird, but I dealt with it. And now they've settled into a weird groove where there's just a lot of scouts on the kitchen counter, which I've scoured with all kinds of things, and on the floor, which is covered with disinfectant and Bona floor spray, and they still are checking something out, and I don't know what's going on. There's never a line, you know, the nice formation where you can trace it back and see what the heck is going on, and so I find myself when I'm at home, whatever it is I'm doing, I gotta go out to the kitchen or the dining room and see where the ants are. Where are the ants? And it's making it difficult to get anything done because always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about the ants. Now, I mostly am not waking up in the middle of the night and I'm grateful for that. It's not life's biggest source of stress at the moment and that's nice, but it's disturbing, it's unresolved, and it's having this impact on my ability to concentrate. So. Hopefully you got to tell somebody about what is causing you stress and uh, how you like to rest. The title of this sermon is The One with Rest, uh, because there is someone who has rest and also we're all friends here. The rest in today's passage isn't ant bait. It's not cocktails in a show to relax. It's not even early to bed and early to rise, make somebody other healthy, wealthy, and wise. Um, there are multiple rests in this passage, however, and before we sang our second song, or during it, I apologize, I handed out some signs, and nobody's gonna be able to read these signs from any kind of a distance, but if the five of you who have a sign could hold it up, I'm gonna read off what they say, and what I wanted was a kind of spatial, there are different rests at different times and places. So, rests, God rests, God's rest on the seventh day. Wave that one around a little bit in the back there, yeah. Okay, the rest offered to Israel who rebelled instead. The rest that the promised land might have provided Israel when Joshua led them in. The rest that David spoke of in Psalm 95, which Pastor Tim talked about last week, calling us not to be like ancient Israel, but to worship God and to yield to him. And finally, the rest in Christ, who is alive and is gonna judge. All right, thank you, sign holders. I will be calling on you again later, but right now. As I listen to the passage being read, my sense was the same as it's been for several weeks as I've been reading this passage. It's hard to follow. Um, it's talking about these different rests and it's talking in different orders. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna summarize sort of verse by verse. Summarize, okay? But this is the verse by verse part this week. So verse one says, rest is still available to us today. It's not a historical thing only. Verse two says, we have received the good news, yay, but it also says the Israelites in the wilderness had also received good news, but they didn't follow it. Verse three, the beginning says, we who have believed enter rest. That sounds great. Second part of verse three and verse four say, God's rest began after the creation of the world. Verse five says the rebellious Israelites, yay, in the desert, Boo, we're blocked from God's rest. Verse six says, some will still enter God's rest. Israel heard good news, but their disobedience kept them out. I'm hearing a theme there. I don't know about you. Okay, and then this is the problem with not using a computer. <clears throat> Verse seven says, in David's time, God set a day to respond to God's voice and not harden our hearts. Verse eight says, Joshua entered the promised land with Israel, Israel the next generation really, but obviously didn't get them rest. Verse nine says, God's people still have a rest awaiting. Verse 10 says, entering God's rest means resting from our own works. 
Verse 11 says we ought to enter that rest rather than perish like Israel by disobedience. Okay. And verses 12 and 13 say God's word is penetrating, judges everything, seen and unseen, and God sees all and will be accountable for all. And there's this mix of hope and bad old news and warnings for today. And rather than try to follow the pattern of the verses, we're going to reorganize a little bit. And here's the approach. Why is rest needed? We're going to talk about that. What is rest? And how do we get it? So, verse 1. Why is rest needed? Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So why is rest needed? The first reason that rest is needed is the alternative to resting is missing out. That's counterintuitive in some ways, but without rest, we're going to miss what's best. Okay, there's a promise of rest open to us, and last week's passage talked about the people of Israel under Moses turning away from God, not knowing God's ways. As a consequence, their hearts were hardened toward God. So these are people who had seen daily miracles. Daily. (sighs) They're people who kept going astray despite seeing miracles every day. Can you imagine? God went with them visibly. They could see signs of his presence every day, and they kept disobeying him. And maybe you have seen God act. You are aware of his presence, but you feel how you feel. And right now, it kind of doesn't feel like God is your answer. And because I believe there's at least one person sitting in this room who feels that way, I want to stop and pray before we continue. So, Father, we come to you as a group. Some of us have always been wandering. Some here are usually faithful, but we're still prone to wander, and we are aware of the fact, God. Would you help us by the way you illuminate your word today to see what your rest is, to to desire it, and to obtain it through your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, the next reason we need rest is that we are restless. Yeah, Psalm 55, verse 2. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught. Okay, I like the way the ESV translates that second line. I am restless in my complaint and I moan. And, you know, between those two, my thoughts trouble me and I am distraught. I'm thinking ants. I am restless in my complaint and I moan. It's, it's the more serious stuff in my life that comes more to mind when I think about that. Why? David is restless. He lacks rest. That's what restless means. And he's not at rest, right? Obviously. We need rest because we are restless. If you've got a family situation going on, if you're in or have been in a relationship that's falling apart, if you've lost a job uh, or had a job start going wrong even, if, I don't know, you've had a legal tangle or money problems or the government coming after you for some reason, you know that feeling of persistent restlessness, way bigger than ants, unless they're the massive ones from horror movies, right? Troubling thoughts can plague us And as we think about the future, all we can think about is this disturbing what might happen, and we feel restless. The next reason that we need rest is that we need the kind of shelter that only God's rest can provide. So David is dealing with more difficult issues with deadly enemies, people who hold grudges against him and are coming after him. And Psalm 55, 5 through 8 say this, Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. And oftentimes I find people are indeed on the lookout for a place of shelter from the storm. We need shelter, so we 
are looking for rest and we need rest. Do you have a hideout? Do you have a place to go that's, you know, your, your safe place? Uh, I, I don't currently, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of jelly if you've got one. But what I remember is being a little kid and the property next door, there was a huge shrub and uh, I could climb through the branches and in the middle near the, the trunk of a shrub, I don't know if that's what you call the, the main stalk there, there weren't the leaves and so there was this space and I couldn't be seen and if I was scared or angry or frustrated or I don't know, having the feels of some kind, I could go in there and feel safe for a while. I don't know why. Now I've grown up and they don't really make shrubs big enough for me to do that, but I've got earbuds, so um, that's as close as I get. Um, David is restless. He's looking for escape, for quiet, for shelter, and he even says for rest. He imagines doing what some addiction recovery programs, they, they refer to it as pulling a geographic. So I've made a mess here, and there's, there's things that are happening now that I've had a part in setting in process, but I need to get out of there, and I'm gonna go over here to a different location, different city, different country maybe even, and hope that I don't recreate the same problem wherever I go, pulling a geographic. If you're feeling that kind of chaos, I would actually recommend having a look through all of Psalm 55. There's a way in which David is betrayed and yet encountering relief. But we're not talking about mere relief today. We're talking about rest. Rest is good. Sometimes when the Bible mentions rest, it's talking about sleep. Sometimes it's talking about death. And that's mostly not what we're looking for in this room. And those aren't the kinds of rest that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. And so the question is, what isn't rest? Let's start there. So we've got some wrong rest ideas. And one wrong rest idea has to do with rest being bad, okay? Um, if you're a parent of a student in Cupertino, this might be your go-to kind of mentality. But the book of Proverbs communicates this as well. Proverbs 6, starting in verse 9. How long will you lie there, sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Work hard, avoid danger, don't let up. We've got deadlines here. Consider the ant. Keep marching in these lines until we get to the finish line. The whole world will fall apart otherwise is a mentality that exists in our valley. Did you know that? For a time, this was the prevailing corporate culture, in fact, in our little valley. And that's maybe beginning to change, but laying all your effort before an idol called work isn't going to be a path to a softened heart, to healthy relationships, to fellowship with your Savior. And at the same time, I've got a warning for you. People who live by this are going to eat your lunch at school and work until hypertension takes them out. So they will experience a rest in the end. Uh, so Gen Z has helped us overreact to that and the, the false idea is that rest it comes in balance. And so I, I, I was reading Ecclesiastes and this kind of cracked me up. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? Doesn't sound very Gen Z to me, but I, I hear Clint Eastwood and I can't do him. So that's, that's what we're getting. All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Oh, super. A person can do nothing better than eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? So as people today are looking for a better life-work balance, okay, wanting to enjoy your meals and enjoy your work, 
seems like a reasonable part of that. But a balanced attitude towards work and relaxation isn't how we attain the rest that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. It, it's just not gonna get us there because rest isn't a state of mind. Rest is a state of being. And how we think about our circumstances has something to do with how restful we are. But the circumstances that we're in, uh, let's put it this way, either we're gonna enter God's rest or we're not. We don't put on a restful mindset. We enter God's rest or we don't. And finally, there's such a thing as false rest. And again, uh, I thought about a book in the Hebrew scriptures named after a, a guy named Nehemiah who worked for the Persian king, and he wanted to see Jerusalem rebuilt. Jerusalem had been trashed, and the Persians had something to do with it, and the king was like, sure, you can go do that, and here's some resources, get her done. And so they go to Jerusalem, and he sets about organizing and planning and rebuilding the city. Fantastic. There's some regional opposition, but they, they face it. And one day the Israelites are there together and they're having some kind of worship. And they're saying, my goodness, let's confess. And they confess. And they say, let's worship. And they worship. And then they spend a quarter of a day reading the scriptures. So please come at me with how long our 90-minute services feel. They pray together and they recount how God originally freed them from slavery and allowed them to enter the land and occupy it and how resource-rich it was. It was amazing. And then they acknowledge the cycle of Israel rejecting God, God rescuing them, and Israel rejecting God again. And here's how that the passage uh, concludes. Nehemiah 9.28, but as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven and in your compassion, you delivered them time after time. This isn't real rest. It says, it says something about rest. It says, yeah, it, it says they got, no, they didn't get real rest. What they got is almost the opposite of rest. It wasn't being in God's will, loving God, following him, experiencing him the way he intended to be experienced. Instead, it's the absence of something to freak them out. There aren't enemies standing here. We don't have a famine. There's not currently a plague rolling through. Fine, we're good. We don't have to worry about anything. Their sense of security comes from the absence of anyone attacking, conquering, and enslaving them. So those are examples of false rest or, or false ideas of rest. What is true rest? So let's look again at the rests we saw in the passage earlier. So sign people, I apologize. If you could hold those five signs up again one more time and take a look around. Just, you know, these rests are in different space. So God's rest on the seventh day. True rest is where God rules. God isn't inactive. He's currently holding all things together. And here's what Jesus says in John 5. My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. So we know about, in one verse, two persons of our one God who are at work, but they're at rest. So rest isn't the absence of work. Interesting. God has been working. It doesn't mean not do anything. It means living in the peace that God makes. You can put the signs down. I, thank you. I had half a mind to just let you keep holding them on and on, but <clears throat> I'd like you to experience a small amount of rest. So God made a world and he allowed it to allow us choices that could disrupt that world and disrupt the rest. He allowed our motives and our choices and our actions to disturb what happened in his creation, which is a lot of responsibility. It's amazing that he gave it to us. But God himself can't be disrupted. And where he is, there is shelter. 
But the stories that we've heard so far are about people who keep wandering away. God is our hiding place in whom we can rest, and the command for Israel to keep the Sabbath is something that isn't repeated by Jesus. He doesn't say, and now you must keep the Sabbath. But he observes the Sabbath. He gets called on the carpet for observing it wrong, like healing on a Saturday. Because Jesus' model is to be submitted to God every day. Not to separate out one day where I'm going to pay attention to God, and then the rest of the week, hope for the best. Now, he's yielded to the Father's will every day, and so Sabbath rest breaks into the rest of the week in the life of Jesus, and the church reflects that. That's why we worship on Sunday, because we're starting off our week the way we're going to continue it, not with a service, not because it's so awesome to have four songs in a lecture, but as a, an opportunity for us to gather, to worship, to connect as a community, and then to continue to do those things as we go out. Second rest was the rest offered to Israel who rebelled instead. So God orchestrated a slave rebellion and escape from Egypt. So Israel gets to depart from Egypt, but Israel continued not to trust God, continued not to follow God, continued to be tempted, continued to be distracted by their own desires, and God's rest is freedom from slavery, not just to oppressors, but to our own appetites and sin. Can you imagine being an Israelite who is free from slavery and missing the leeks and onions and willing to not make it into the promised land and the bounty that it held because of that? The rest that the promised land might have provided Israel when Joshua led them in. So, the first generation doesn't believe, they disobey, they keep rebelling, and they don't make it into the promised land. But Joshua leads the next generation in. And that's fantastic. They, they take the land, and even as they're taking the land, there are these cases of rebellion, of disobeying God's instructions for how to do it, how to go about it. There are cases where they don't talk to God about making a plan that they're going to make, and it has consequences. Worst of all, once Joshua dies, I, I mean, it's not like he's in the ground and immediately there's chaos, but it's pretty quick. And if you read the next book, Judges, it, it gets pretty ridiculous. So the nation under Joshua, and especially following Joshua, didn't experience anything like what we think of as God's rest. Then there's the rest that David spoke of in Psalm 95, calling us not to be like ancient Israel, but to worship and yield to him. So David says, don't go your own way. Instead, worship God and make his way your way. That is the rest that God's going to provide you, even if it feels hard sometimes. Finally, there's the rest in Christ, who is alive and will judge. And the writer of Hebrews doesn't say in this passage, Jesus is alive and will be your judge, and that's why you can get rest. But as we look at how you get rest, we'll see that's true. How do we get rest? There's actually not a direct answer to that question either, but it does tell us who enters God's rest. It's about relationship, not action so much. So verse 3 answers that question quite clearly. Now we who have believed enter that rest. So there are two key ideas in there. There's the we and there's the have believed. Okay, tough. Who enters God's rest? Well, the first thing, he doesn't say you individually enter God's rest. That's not the conception. The conception is that God's people will enter his rest. Faith in God is not supposed to be a solitary activity. And one of the reasons that we gather together is to give ourselves an opportunity to develop relationship and have people who can speak truth into our lives and we can speak truth into theirs. But more importantly than that, rest is obtained in community. It's not a solitary state. It happens in community. 
We come together because God connects individuals in relationship, which isn't surprising since our one God has been three persons lovingly interacting with each other since before creation was begun. We're not connected by blood the way that Jacob's offspring was. We are instead connected by belief that the infinite personal God and his promises and his plan are true. And we are still connected by blood, but it's no longer our blood that matters. It's the blood that was shed up there. And that's where rest is going to be coming from through the work of Jesus. But there's nothing more natural than lacking faith. So verse two says, we have had good news proclaimed to us just as Israel did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Just hearing new, good news doesn't make us obedient to God. This idea is repeated. Verses 6 and 11. Those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that one, no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So what is this effort that we can make to enter the rest God made for us? And I think the biggest answer that we have to that is to put off disguise. So my son Calvin used to do a thing. He'd say, I'm going to hide. And he'd put his hands over his eyes. Or he'd pull a blanket over his head. And he'll, still, he'll do that from time to time to amuse us. It's, it's still entertaining to us. But this wanting to hide, it, it's not something just Calvin does. It's not something that he merely got from Karen and from me. It's something we all do, and it goes back to all of our original parents, right? Adam and Eve in the garden, in Genesis chapter 3, they had one job to manage everything. They had one rule, don't eat that fruit. <laughs> when they ate that one fruit, they broke that one rule, and they made that one job of managing everything really difficult, practically impossible. It makes a burden that we still feel. And the relationship between them cracked a bit. It wasn't like it was before. Childbearing would be tough. That's certainly true. The earth was cursed, so I'm awesome at growing weeds, less so other things. But even before any of those consequences were explained to them, what did they do? They saw they were naked, they were ashamed, and they covered themselves pathetically with fig leaves, as though God couldn't see what they looked like. Isn't that crazy? And yet we are inclined to do the same thing. We have an inclination to be ashamed of ourselves, and we cover that in a variety of ways. We don't feel good about ourselves. We don't want to know what God has to say about us. What if he doesn't like us? Because we know he can see through our disguises. And that's why I think the end of this passage is both frightening and freeing. Verses 12 and 13, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints to marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And this is frightening because God has given us not words on papyrus, but his living word that can see and can cut through us. And it judges our insides, not like nice spleen, but hey, Mike, uh, is your attitude toward that person in line with your own standard, let alone mine? God sees it all. Every thoughtless, every cruel, every ignorant, every well-intentioned, every true thing that I say, God knows about it and he knows the motives behind what I've been saying. He knows how much of what you and I do is a performance that we put on. He knows how much it differs from his standard, not just our own standards. But this passage is freeing to me because God isn't some kind of creep who set up webcams all through our lives, okay? He's not the architect from the matrix. 
he engages us in Jesus who lived in this crazy broken world so that you and I could live without hiding. What did Jesus say about rest? He said the most beautiful and encouraging thing I can imagine God saying to me. He said, I've got this. How did he say I've got this? Look at Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And that's how we get rest. We stop hiding from ourselves. We stop hiding from God. We admit to ourselves and to God that we've been weighed down by concerns and responsibilities and fears. And instead of responding naturally to that, we're going to respond to the one who loved us enough to give up everything because Jesus allows us to know how perfect and yet how sympathetic the Father is. He gives us shelter and he gives us rest. We studied John's first letter not long ago. John has a lovely way of talking about rest in 1 John 3, 19 through 24. This is how we know we belong to the truth and set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, it's okay because we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. <laughs> and unlike us, he can handle it. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Oh, no, I've got to keep his commands. And this is his command, to believe in the name, the authority, the power, the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded. The one who keeps God's commands, those two commands, lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gives us. All three persons of the Godhead are invested in giving you rest. Not just ultimate rest in God's presence, but rest today for what you're facing. And we can't trust our hearts, but we can trust God. The commands that we're given are not commands that can't be done. Believe the Son, love one another. So we're not called to one morning a week or to a, a wild retirement or a quiet one for that matter. We're called to live in step with the spirit we've been given. And maybe that sounds like a limited life to you. That's definitely possible. But it's not. It's an active kind of rest that depends upon our continuing to feast in the sun. And worship team, I'd like to call you up. We're going to conclude this going back to the beginning of Hebrews. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. He spoke to us by son. The language that God speaks to us in is Jesus Who's Jesus? Among other things, he's the word. He's what makes the word true for us. And the spirit lighting that up in our lives as we f help one another to see what it means is spectacular. And that son's name is his authority. And so I want to I wanna pray along with St. Augustine as we close. Father, we stand with you in order to stand firmly. We rest in you in order to be rested. If we go into rough places, God, would you cause us to think the good that we love is from you, but it's only good and sweet if we see that in reality, it is from you. If we are walking on and on through difficult and restless paths, we know there is no rest where we seek it. Save us from seeking a happy life where death is to be found. 
Thank you for the one who did not abandon us, but entered what he created in order to save ones like us. And we confess the rebellion, disobedience, and faithlessness in our hearts, knowing that in Jesus Christ, you heal our hearts. Unite us with you, Father, and give us rest. Amen.